That's that moment of hush which happens, and I never, ever know why. People always seem to know. Are we ready to go? Great. Um, I'm not going to say very much at all, except it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event in the annual Arts and Humanities Festival here at King's. I'm Deborah Bull. I'm Director of Cultural Partnerships. And my role is to build on the college's long history of partnerships with the cultural sector in order to connect artists and arts organizations with the research excellence of King's across its nine schools. So in short, I have the great privilege of bringing together some of the best and most creative academic minds with cultural practitioners. Um, and it's a role I'm very, very happy to have here at the college. Tonight's event absolutely does just that. It brings together Shobhan Ajaya Singh, who is a renowned choreographer and director of her own dance company, with Dr. Thrish Nanayakara, who is from the Center for Robotics in the Department of Inform Informatics. That's right, here at King's. So um, Shobana came into contact with Thrish and a number of King's academics through her work with King's Cultural Institute, which exists to broker those relationships between the cultural sector and, and, and academics. Um, and she's one of three knowledge producers working with the Institute over an extended period of time um, to, to address a key question or concern in collaboration with academics. Um, the program recognizes that artistic practice is in itself an act of research or an experiment with the artist seeking to address and inquire about something, but crucially playing out that research in a, in a public environment and engaging with the public in a, in a, in a, in a way of generating feedback um, for their process. So um, Shobana and Thrish ha are at the beginning of a process, really. This is not, not so much a, a work in progress, but a conversation in progress. And tonight, they're going to talk about their methods, um, the way that they might work together, and interestingly, the d very different approach or concept they have of programming, Shobana programming the body, and Thrish programming things that I don't claim to understand, but you're going to tell us about. So um, many thanks to all of you for joining us. I think we're going to have a fantastic evening, and I'm going to hand over now so you can hear from them. Thanks. Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming, and it's lovely to see so many old friends whom I haven't seen for a very long time. Um, so you might ask, why is a choreographer um, interested in robotic systems? Um, I guess uh, the answer to that is that both, I mean, people like Trish who work uh, in creating robotic systems and myself are really interested in human biomechanics. And really that's something um, that when I first came to be part of a, as a knowledge producer at King's and I was given this wonderful opportunity to, to meet and talk with different types of academics, you know, from film studies, uh, geography department, uh, neuroscience, obviously and the Center for Robotics Research. Um, they were all absolutely fascinating for me, but uh, when I spoke to Trish and his colleague Casper, we both found ourselves talking really animatedly about the body and how it works. And I found I was talking about how I look at bodies and what sort of main movements I make as a choreographer and what interests me. And Trish and his colleague were talking about what they get out of the human body. So we had that area in common. I hasten to tell you from the beginning, it's not really, I haven't got any answers. I don't think Trish or has any answers either about robots dancing with dancers. I think that's um, you know, probably in the future and it sounds very grand. I think what I'm doing today with Trish is to really share with you what I've taken from my conversations with him and uh, to show you the kind of what hopefully would be the common ground for a future collaboration between a choreographer and someone who works uh, with robotics. So um, as a choreographer, I kind of feel that you know, what I do is program bodies. And that might actually sound incredibly mechanical. Um, but I think in a way, you know, when in common parlance, when we say robotics or robotic movement, we have a, a very particular idea of very limited movements, uh, perhaps something very cold and very functional. But for me, actually, that's not really what interests me. It's, uh, what interests me is, um, is I kind of feel that when I, uh, when I choreograph a, a body, 
in some ways, it's a very artificial act. It's an act of artifice because you, you, you take the body and in some ways you give it tasks, you make it move that are not functional. It's not about catching a bus or making a cup of tea or any of those things that you use bodies for. But one tries to create meaning and one tries to design movements which are there. They could be political reasons, for aesthetic reasons. Um, and so one's motivation for engaging with the body and designing the body are very particular and very personal. So my interest was whether with a robotic system, with an intelligent robotic system, whatever it is, and I, I think uh, a, a robot that like, looks like a human in a way is incidental because um, a robot could be something that looks nothing like a human. It could look like an octopus or it could look like an elephant or it could be nothing except some dots on a screen. But it's an intelligent system which I think uh, for a choreographer could be really fascinating as a partner. I mean, dance traditionally has different types of partners. You know, music is the very first one I can think of. Um, design in a stage. And as a choreographer, for example, recently I made a piece which was for pews in a church. And that's a very particular kind of partnership, a, a very particular spatial partnership, where one had these uh, very bounded spaces where dancers could appear and disappear from. Um, recently in the Dance Umbrella Festival, there's a duet between uh, a dancer and a mechanical digger. That's a different kind of partnership. Um, so in every case, I think a choreographer immediately makes partnership with something, and space is the, is the first one. Um, you know, how we carve it out, how we deploy the body in the space, also time. And then, of course, there are other material partners, you know, such as a set, could be a lighting design, could be costumes. So for me, um, a programmed entity with its own intelligence, and obviously that intelligence can be very different to a human intelligence, I think that would make a very fascinating partnership. So I think today what we are trying to do is, um, actually, Trish and I, I think we're just extending our conversations. We've had them in his lab, um, and I think now we're going to sort of have them in front of you. So we haven't really prepared uh, sort of a miracle to happen, and suddenly we find robots dancing with humans, or even, uh, you know, how one would go about it. But actually, maybe making visible two different types of programming, and to see uh, and discover actually now whether it's possible, you know, do, are there any areas of commonality? Is it going to be of interest to a choreographer? And is it of any use to someone who works in robotics? So that's really what this evening is about. So we're going to start off. Trish is going to explain a little bit about his process and his research interests. So uh, I, uh, I'm Trishanta, uh, and this, this is my lab. Uh, these are my PhD students. Um, they are from different countries, and uh, so Max is from Spain, Alan is from California, uh, Giuseppe is from Italy, and uh, Lisa from Latvia, Anrada from Sri Lanka, and uh, uh, is three from Sri Lanka, Nadichai from Thailand, and me from originally from Sri Lanka, and then Angela from Italy. Um, so uh, it is. It, it happens that like we are roughly half of them are uh, females, uh, and then um, the, the, our mission is like somehow to disprove some myths that uh, you know <laughs> engineering or robotics is not for uh, women. 
uh, they, they have collapsed, you know, kind of destroyed that myth. And uh, they are award winning uh, PhD students. And uh, that itself is a proof that anybody can do anything. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so robotics started in you know uh, engineers didn't didn't start that uh, robots. Uh, um, there's a smart uh, guy called uh, Karl Kopeck. Um, he coined the term. Robot, robot uh, in Czech language is forced labor. Uh, so, uh, in 1921, like um, most of the southern states of the United States uh, had slavery, and then um, slavery was kind of abolished, but uh, still this this was this was a problem. Uh, and then he he came up with the alternative solution, and he really depicted that in, in a stage drama. And then he got people to uh, act like robots. And then he said, future uh, intelligent uh, machines, uh, that will th they will be called robots uh, to represent uh, forced labor. They will uh, be ready to you know, be a substitute for slaves. And then you can free the slaves. You can give them a better education, and then get them to be, you know, productive citizens in the in the society. So this is how the whole thing started. And um, young engineers, yeah, you know, young students uh, saw these kind of dramas, and they were so inspired, and they started uh, all the robotic research centers in the world. And my immediate uh, supervisor, or my my PhD advisor, was a second generation of that. Uh, team who started at MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and Stanford. Um, so uh, now, then the problem was uh, when we look at humans, what they, what they do is amazing. And then uh, you know, uh, humans can run on one type of terrain, and then they can immediately go to another type of terrain, even muddy, and then they can get back on another terrain, and they can maintain stability. Uh, and they can juggle, they can control another animal, uh, you know, walk on rope, um, do this uh, high jumping, and even karate, like uh, precise timing and positioning is, uh, and velocity control. So this is virtually impossible, and this is for the robots. So our generation of uh, researchers in robotics are faced with this huge gulf. Rossum's universal robots posed as a challenge. Okay, make a robot that can, uh, you know, be a substitute for hard labor, and then now we have human elegance. So our job is to bridge this gap. So um, uh, in my lab, uh, we are uh, trying to ask questions like, so what what makes uh, humans so elegant? Is that their central nervous system? Uh, it is the degrees of freedom of the body or how they interact with the environment. And uh, where is the computation? What can we program, what we cannot program, and what we don't have to program uh, are the questions. So if we, if we look at, carefully look at other people's work, my colleagues' work, uh, for example, Andy Ruina's work, <coughs> uh, this robot has no brain. There's no program. It's just a mechanical system. It can walk like a human. Uh, so. Uh, here, another from the backside. You just you just let it go, and then it walks. There's no computer. There's no circuit. Nothing. So 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 what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> so you really don't need a brain uh, to do a lot of things. <laughs> right? uh, so that is and this example. This is a dead fish. You can see a dead fish here. And it starts to swim, right? So uh, when when you put a dead fish against a current, uh, so water stream coming against it, and then when you start the uh, when you start to increase the speed of this water stream against the body, the body becomes uh, you know begins to be alive, <laughs> and then uh, see what happens. Um, see, right? And that's a dead body. And it, it swims up, 
against the current now. So it, it, it has no brain, the brain is dead. Uh, so what does this mean? See, it, it can go even against the current and flow upwards. What does this mean? If your body um, morphology, that is the stiffness distribution and the shape is tuned to the statistics of the environment, that is the, cur the, the turbulence of the environment, you can harness energy from the environment. The body will harness energy and then uh, give rise to productive movements like propulsion forward even. So uh, this is the secret of m almost all animals. Like we can, we can, I can have a, just a cup of tea in the morning and then work till uh, noon if I want to. Uh, I mean, all theories of metabolism will say it cannot, it cannot happen. Uh, you know, some 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 birds uh, fly from uh, the Arctic Tern, for example, uh, from from you know from the North Pole to the South Pole, and even if you burn the whole body, that calories is in a, not enough. It's Arctic Tern's body if you burn it, and calculate the num amount of calories it can produce. It is not enough to cross that ocean. So how do they do that? They don't fly really. The environment they are, they they they. they Expose uh, it may be kind of compliant to the environmental uh, statistics, and then the environment gives them the energy. The the how they how they post their body against the wind uh, wind patterns, and then how they relax the wings, and everything matters. So programming the intelligence is not really in the brain. It is the brain, the body, and the environment put together. So. It is the computation happens everywhere. You remove the environmental condition, the, suddenly the bird or the uh, animal becomes very funny, or you know it, it is not natural uh, anymore. Uh, so uh, you take all the like, for example, yeah, you change the speed of the water, uh, the dead body is a dead body. <laughs> right? You get to that right current, the speed, it becomes so alive. So. Uh, uh, we are so fascinated about this uh, thing. We call it morphological computation. Uh, so, uh, meaning computation happens uh, everywhere. It is one big program, and then you cut off one part, you you destroy that program. So, conventionally, robotics used to be that you you look at the environment, the disturbances as an enemy, and then you program everything to just suppress that. So from our generation, we just uh, we, we go, go against that notion. And then we say, no, it is the entirety that matters. And then uh, we, we, we somehow, if we can get a robot to be in harmony with the whole entirety, environmental uh, interactions, you can orchestrate intelligence. You cannot program intelligence. Intelligence is in the air. It, it, that, that is the whole, whole, whole idea of uh, our lab. And I, I'm not alone. Uh, I'm come from my, my, uh, my uh, training at Harvard University and MIT uh, and Johns Hopkins, like we, 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 we share uh, this, this philosophy uh, across the borders, US and UK. Uh, I, I'll give you a, one quick example. One of my undergraduate students did this, uh, this robot. So he wanted to make a robot that can walk on uh, soft like weed without destroying them, without without even damaging them. So, how can we do that? <laughs> like, so if you if you get a normal robot to walk on that kind of soft, uh, you know, alone, it'll damage and it'll leave a trace definitely. Uh, this robot doesn't leave a trace because how it interacts with with that environment uh, is not programmed. It just orchestrates that behavior. It, it, it goes into it, and then it just adapts to it so quickly, instantly. And then it, it crosses over to the other lawn, and the behavior is completely different. So, uh, so th this is the type of uh, thing. And if I give another example, uh, we call it uh, affordances. Uh, this whole thing is, uh, uh, for example, uh, we call, OK, this a bottle. Uh, so that's that's a socially conditioned label for this object, but for a robot to accomplish a task, this can be a pointer. This can even be a weapon. This can this can be some tool uh, you can use to fix a bicycle or something. 
So in the future robots that, that are supposed to be working in households, we expect the robots not to uh, use labels uh, used by uh, humans. Uh, so humans may need a f spoon and a fork to eat, but the robot will do the same thing with something that can do the same function. So it's functionality is what matters. So for example, like if you, if you want to, if you look at how people hold the cup, depending on the end they use, the way they hold the cup is different. Uh, so then the robots can watch this and then learn. So this is uh, what we do in learning based on demonstrations. So it passively watches and then, uh, then makes associations and then learn. So there's a result is this, for example. <laughs> um, sorry. OK, so. So um, it, we, we, uh, the previous video showed uh, how it learns by watching. And then here it, 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 gra it learns to grasp um, different other objects that was not presented to him. Like uh, he just generalizes knowledge across different objects. Uh, and now he can grasp a, a robotic mouse, a phone receiver. He never, he never was taught or programmed to do this. Uh, it's just, just generalization of uh, some previous knowledge, uh, uh, it does. And then even gardening tools. So the whole idea is um, uh, look at the environment as just opportunities and utilities, not as labels, as we do. Uh, like it's a, it doesn't know that it's a telephone receiver. It just knows that I can do this with that. that that's all. <laughs> Uh, and then we are uh, collaborating with uh, various uh, government and institutes like firefighters. Uh, so uh, in this case, like we want to have a robot to assist these firefighters to move in this indoor firefighting scenario where you know, they have oxygen only for 20 minutes, but they have to move in thick smoke. Uh, in, uh, for example, it's a warehouse firefighting. And uh, they have only 20 minutes. They have to do something in 10 minutes and get back, and they get you know, really panicked. And then uh, what we try to do is to have a robot that can grow up uh, in this uh, you know, uh, darkness, for example, low visibility environment, and then uh, understand the environment and quickly communicate back to the human using a rain, <laughs> just a rain. Like uh, now the human is right in the hose, uh, when the, we want the robot to ride the human using just a rope. Uh, because the, the, these humans, uh, they cannot hear anything because oxygen mask is so noisy. Uh, and they cannot see. Now they're down to only tactile feedback. And then we found uh, some mathematical models that can uh, help the robot to know the panic situation or the, the confidence level of the human who is following. Uh, and then the robot really uh, reacts to that situation and then um, works with the human, uh, you know, without stressing the human uh, too much. So, and then these robots will be, in the future, will be used in firefighting, uh, in many disaster response operations, uh, hopefully, uh, like Fukushima or something, uh, and then uh, in household uh, activities, like helping a housewife. Uh, to cook or clean, wash, you know, things. Uh, and then the, the whole challenge is to make them cheap and then be functional. So that's what we are working on. And then uh, when I met um, uh, Shobana, it was, uh, it was really intimidating. Like, you know, Shobana was uh, showing these uh, people who can do amazing things. Uh, but she really encouraged me, okay, so uh, if we have a do it, uh, we can uh, use the robot to understand what is going on 
in the human mind and the body, and then we can use the human's reactions to understand better ways of uh, you know, making robots more intelligent. So it is just a beginning, and then we are so excited about uh, this. And then um, really we want to be uh, the first to do this in the world. Uh, even I come from US, uh, but uh, uh, we want to be the best <laughs> in the UK. Uh, so uh, let's see how it goes. All right, thank you very much. You can see why I was so inspired by talking to Thresh. Um, I suppose um, the, the first thing after I spoke to him, and you know, when he talked about environment, that's something that I really, that kind of uh, resonated with me, because one of the things that I've kind of discovered as a choreographer, uh, or my first step in learning, was really in some ways a bit like what Trish said, that um, the quality of movement, actually the first sort of uh, signature I'm, I can make as a choreographer is the relationship of the body to the space around it. Uh, I come from a sort of classical dance background, and so I, I just got very used to actually taking for granted the space around me, so I kind of felt I could put my arm out and it, I had the facility and the permission to actually do that without any uh, difficulty. Obviously, when you train, there are difficulties in order to make that, but actually we kind of thought it was our right to do that. And one of the first things I did when I thought about why I choreograph and how I choreograph, I realized that in fact I wanted to send a completely different information about the space around the body. And so I started off thinking about space as a combative space. So whatever movement the dancer made, I actually wanted to make the point that it's a space that's actually fought and won uh, rather than given or uh, as an entitlement. Um, obviously, when I work with dancers, and I'm going to call uh, Avatar and Richard to come now and help with this next bit, um, it's obviously very different to creating a robotic system because you, we already start with something, something very rich. Avatar is from Spain. She's trained as a classical ballet dancer, but she also trained in contemporary dance and being Spanish, she has some flamenco feeling for flamenco and rhythm. Um, Richard is from Australia. He's got his own rich background. So as a choreographer, when you start with these entities, apart from their kind of hyper um, facilities as trained dancers, because they're kind of not a body, they're the body, the trained body, plus their cultural richness, you, al you already start with something so given, and designing anything with bodies like that, it's a particular, uh, it's a very particular activity. So I'm just going to uh, see how one can maybe, this is what I wanted to do for Trish, is to show him a little bit about how one programs, uh, if that's not too much a reductive word, uh, a body for choreographic. So one of the simplest things, well, actually, a lot of choreographers start off. Can you hear me if I go away from the mic? Mm -hmm. With just getting dancers to copy something they've made themselves. And there's always stage one. So you walk in your bedroom or your studio and you make complicated movements, and you come to the studio and say, OK, right, and you look at the mirror, five, six, seven, eight, and please copy what I do. And actually, that's a really important facet of human activity and creativity, and also probably for robotics, is copying. Um, and so that's one thing. But uh, for myself over the years, I found myself, actually, I think I've you know, probably reached the limits of what I can do with my own body. Um, and so I generate, this task one is actually generating movements, and the creativity of the dancer is a very important part. So one of the things that we've been doing in the studio, because I've been thinking about plants for, for the next piece that I'm choreographing called Strange Blooms, and we were looking at photographs and uh, images of tendrils. Actually, we, I found this wonderful um, YouTube clip of a morning glory sapling trying um, to cling to a, a, a support. And the way, the energy, obviously, we can art like this game, but 
in its own time scale, the, the dynamic, the ruthlessness, the energy, and the focused quality of what he's doing, plus it, the circular movement. So I gave those two images, and uh, Richard came up with this sketch. Uh, So we took that example and then we said, well, how can we put that into different levels? So uh, when we took it to the chest level, uh, we made that. And then when we took it to the hip level. This <laughs> has changed. <laughs>
the love duet or anything as uh, immediately readable as that. There's a lot of, uh, of empathy, really, between two bodies because they have to uh, be aware of what the other person is doing, and especially when you complicated, closely related partnerships, there's a very sophisticated um, mental and physical activity. And I, I really kind of think that it's not really the brain that controlling the body, but an embodied brain, because that's really what I've learned by looking at dancers, that actually the dancing brain is all over the body from the eye in every tip. Um, now, obviously, I could then um, find different ways of exploiting that movement. So a bit like, you know, uh, Trish, when he's talking about the firefighters, he had a particular aim. He wanted that robot to do something, you know, rain in the firefighter. So choreographically, one of the similar things, like, for example, like a, this is something I'm just asking you to do now, which is take a phrase that we developed in the studio, but we're both going to be held together, and so you're going to create tension. So your arms are always going to be straight. And so we're going to see what happens to each of your phrases when you want to contend with the other person's weight. And while you do that, I just want you to look at um, places where you can uh, maybe use the negative spaces that are created by the other person's phrase um, and see what happens.
she is going to act out one of her decisions, either near or far. Since I don't have a third answer, I'll be the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to move and you are going to, um, yeah, no, I know. You're going to make sure that you're always in somewhere where there's equidistance between me and Altada. And that doesn't have to mean you're in a straight line. You can be equidistant in lots of different ways. You can have an angle. You can be in a triangle. So where the three sort of points of the triangle. And every time, if I go near Mette, which is sitting here, if I'm actually here near Mette, then I want you to respond to that by maybe going into unison. So I was going to go but I'll leave you, maybe you're going to copy her, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so, um,
diagonal shapes. So can we just see the six shapes?
because that's all you might need. Um, so if one put a human arm, which has got but seven degrees of freedom, and another non-human arm, which has got a different degree of freedom, I think together, I think the possibilities for a different kind of meaning, the first time dance and music came together, probably there was a whole added layer of meaning that was possible. So I, I kind of feel that actually uh, that would be an ama amazing thing. So just as a very, very short uh, sketch, and Trish has given me two ideas that he wants uh, one of the dancers to take on as if they were a robotic system. And it's very much on the hoof, so it's... Uh, so I think what you said was, um, one dancer, the, the robot dancer, perhaps with their lower limbs, uh, they can do two steps, and with their arm, they can only have that movement. So, if Richard, <laughs> <laughs> you are the robotic system, and Avatara, you're going to be doing your tendon face, okay, with the Google. Yeah. And we're going to see whether Richard can explore the negative spaces within these. When I mean negative space, I mean you know when you move your arm like that, all the space you don't use. Whether with that, uh, I wouldn't say it's a limited freedom actually, it's just prescribed freedom. Every activity the human beings always, always involves the idea of the limit, and all creativity, the first thing you do is to actually draw the limit. So I don't think just being able to take two steps and do that with the arm is limited or limiting. I just think it's different, and it has different meaning possibilities. So, uh, Richard, is that meaning possibility, and you have yours. Okay. And so if I say, well, actually, um, you know, if you had your full, you know, human freedom. Uh, can you see how you would uh, how you would test the negative? Uh, yeah, so that could happen like that. Yeah. And can you show us the phrase in which we set, which is uh, it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. 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 A way of testing those spaces. So if he couldn't do that, but if he could only use two steps and that movement, let's see what happens. I think you made it a bit slower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very young robot. <laughs>
in house Florida, let's say, in a scenario where you had a beef with the housewife uh, or the housewife in the in the confined area of a kitchen, and then it will be using tools without harming each other. <laughs> so, you know, those negative spaces, all these things are really, oh, it can be feeding or caring an elderly person. Uh, so, uh, within the next, let's say, 10 to 20 years, we definitely need uh, robots uh, to assist, uh, uh, you know, emotionally and physically assist uh, elderly people. Uh, and it's a big goal for us. Uh, and that definitely can benefit from this kind of. So we're just on the beginning of our uh, journey. I don't think there are lots of questions we're asking each other, and I'm sure you probably will too. So I hope you can, if you've got any questions or information, I'm sure we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Thank you very much. Please do take one, please do join us to celebrate the 25th anniversary and see the full piece.